with our presenter, Mr. Mahfoud, and others here. Well, it's good to be here. Um, perhaps some persons could come closer if you wish. And we have a few persons online as well. So, Mr. John Mahfoud, Permanent Secretary, Mrs. Sancia Bennett Templar, Deputy Chairman, Mr. Robert Colley, all of whom are at the head table, the staff of the Fair Trading Commission, welcome to the 20th hosting of the Shirley Playfair Lecture, which was started in 2000 to commemorate the life and work on competition law of the Fair, Fair Trading Commission's first chairperson, Mrs. Shirley Playfair. Mrs. Playfair was a passionate advocate for the proper functioning of markets, and she worked assiduously in creating the foundation and structure for the enforcement of competition law in Jamaica. Her daughters, Lisa and Laurie, are not here in person, but they have joined us online. Welcome to our Deputy Chairman, Mr. Colley, who will carry us through the event and moderate the question and answer session. Also to our commissioners and staff and to the commissioners of the Consumer Affairs Commission. We also extend a special welcome to our Permanent Secretary, Mr. Sansa Bennett Templar of the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. And she will have her input into today's session. We must extend apologies on behalf of our chairman, Mr. Donovan White, who is, an, who is unavoidably absent. Welcome also Dr. Peter John Gordon, past chairman of the Fair Trading Commission, continues to support the work of the FTC and to members of the private sector who are here today. Also welcome to the persons who are online as we are streaming live. Each year the FTC seeks to highlight some aspect of competition law and uses the Shirley Playfair lecture as a medium through which to educate the Jamaican stakeholders, whether policymakers, the legal fraternity, the business community, and Jamaican consumers. This year, we're discussing disruptions in supply chains and how the disruptions have affected business and consumer choices. The COVID-19 pandemic is not too long gone, still hanging around. And the Russia and Ukraine war is still on. And these two events have disrupted the global supply chains. These disruptions have impacted Jamaica negatively through a shortage of supply of raw materials and finished goods and through higher freight and other shipping costs, which has impacted businesses and consumers through fewer choices and higher prices, of course. These disruptions have affected the state of competition in several sectors in our economy. It has affected the ability of firms to produce and distribute efficiently, and it has affected the ability of firms to compete effectively. So how do we improve the situation? What do we, do we as a business ministry need to do to facilitate the business community towards addressing the situation for the benefit of all. Mr. Mafood will be speaking more about this topic and we expect to hear from him. So welcome all, and I will now ask P.S. Bennett Templar to bring remarks from our ministry. P.S. Thank you very much, Mr. Miller. Good morning, everyone. Um, let me recognize Mr. Robert Colley, Deputy Chairman of the SD FTC, Mr. John Mafood, President of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association, distinguished ladies and gentlemen here and online, the media, uh, good morning again. Um, let me start by bringing greetings from my minister, the Honorable Aubing Hill, Minister of Industry, Investment and Commerce, who had hoped to be here this morning, um, but has been in Montego Bay um, with the, 
Jamaica Investment Forum 2022, which had its last event last night, and so he was not able to be here. I also bring greetings from our Minister of State um, as well, who would have liked to have been here. Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to be present at today's staging of the Fair Trading Commission's Shirley Playfair Lecture, an annual event that provides opportunity to explore current topical issues and proper solutions to benefit consumers and the business community. As indicated by Mr. Miller, this is the 20th staging of the lecture series, and on behalf of the ministry, which is the parent ministry for the FTC, I extend warm congratulations to the FTC leadership team for maintaining the momentum year after year and for encouraging thought-provoking discussions. The Fair Trading Commission undertakes a critical body of work to protect consumers. This year in particular, its interventions have led to positive development for consumers in the gaming market, online shopping environments, and land surveyor services. The theme they have selected for this year's lecture is particularly relevant. The ministry is mandated to protect and empower consumers whose regular supply of products on shelves and in the markets across the country have been not negatively impacted by the global supply chain disruptions. Research indicates that several factors have caused ongoing global supply chain disruptions, but mo no most notably among them would be the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the Russia-Ukraine war. Many economies around the world contracted, including Jamaica. There were disruptions in global shipment, trade, and commerce. The cost of raw materials increased, and the amount of available capital for investment was reduced. I am proud to say that our business community, including our MSMEs, responded nimbly to the global challenges. This, coupled with the strong support of government and its fiscal policies, ensured that Jamaica now has a stable, thriving economy with a positive outlook. More recently, there has been some stabilization as well as downward movement in factors such as the cost of freight. While the recent challenges have added, highlighted the impairment that can arise with long supply chains, it has also created unprecedented opportunities for investment along with the attendant economic growth prospects for Jamaica and other countries. As companies look to mitigate the risk of long supply chains to business continuity, there is growing interest in nearshoring and shortened supply chain to establish resilience in business operations. CARICOM states have responded with initiatives such as the 25 by 2025 to reduce food imports and strengthen food security in the region. And importantly, extra-regionally, Jamaica, with its proximity to North America, excellent port facilities we have in the audience with us, the CEO for Kingston Terminal, Kingston Freeport Terminal, Terminal Limited, and I'm sure he can give you all the advantages and connectivity associated with the Port of Kingston. Um, so as I was indicating extra-regionally, Jamaica with its proximity to America, to North America, excellent port facilities and connectivity is well suited to take advantage of this current nearshoring paradigm. Investors are showing keen interest in Jamaica. Over the last two days, November 29 and 30, the Ministry and JAMPRO hosted the Invest Jamaica Business Conference in Montego Bay where representatives from more than 50 countries came to hear about investment opportunities available here. Emphasis was placed on areas such as logistics, manufacturing, a solution to global supply chain challenges, and Jamaica's special economic zones, the Jamaica proposition, highlighting the advantages of our special economic zone regime. 
Our Prime Minister, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, emphasized that there has never been a more advantageous time to invest in Jamaica. Dr. The Honorable Nigel Clark, Minister of Finance and the Public Service, spoke to the resilience and continued strengthening of Jamaica's macroeconomic fundamentals, which are transitioning from achieving and, and maintaining economic stability to institutionalizing economic independence. My minister, Senator the Honorable Aubin Hill, delved into the theme of the conference, Jamaica, the nearshore delivery hub of the Caribbean, underpinning our strategic connection across the core sectors of agribusiness, manufacturing, logistics and special economic zones, global digital services, and tourism. Statico Research reported on October 14, 2022, that the global logistics market is projected to reach approximately 14 billion US dollars by 2027. Jamaica must stay focused on gaining a significant portion of the global logistics market share. Investment activity in Jamaica is showing buoyancy. Our Minister of State and our Minister have had a very active schedule of events for the past several weeks, including several groundbreaking ceremonies and events to open additional business locations, notably in the business process outsourcing industry. The Ministry is focused on encouraging and enabling business to invest heavily, to produce substantially higher exports that will engender significantly higher growth and sustained job creation. And that is the theme of our work every day at the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce. With this in mind, our agencies and divisions continue to devise, implement, and implement targeted policies, projects, and initiatives to support and nurture the business community. We also partner with international agencies, the private sector, and government entities to allow for cross-pollination of financial, human, and other resources. Some of these projects are initiatives coordinated by the National Competitiveness Council, a public-private collaborative which is seeing improvements in the business climate as a result of process enhancements across a range of ministries and government entities. Supervisory training for young adults in the global digital services sector. This has been lauded by the business process outsourcing industry as one of the most impactful recent initiatives to support the global digital services sector in Jamaica. Other training, mentoring, and capacity building programs, such as the JBDC's accelerator program for MSMEs, <clears throat> sorry, providing standards, certifications, and accreditation through our agencies, the Jamaica National Agency for Accreditation, JANAC, the Bureau of Standards, the BSJ, and the National Certification Body of Jamaica, the NCBJ, so that the business community can trade locally and internationally with confidence in the quality and conformity of their products and services. The Ministry's efforts are a microcosm of wider government initiatives to nurture the environment for business. Work also continues to promulgate and implement contributory policy issues towards improving and increasing private direct investment, local and foreign, in Jamaica, including special arrangements for enhanced facilities for large priority projects as we seek to foster a business environment that bolsters and enhances economic development and growth through sustainable investments and increased exports. There are also ongoing efforts to improve the ease of doing business by digitizing processes at our border regulatory agencies, attending and amending relevant legislation, 
improving the road infrastructure and broadband connectivity to enhance the business environment, the ease of doing business. As Jamaica's business ministry, the Ministry of Industry, Investment and Commerce commits to being responsive and visionary in our response to the needs of the business community as we seek to advance the national agenda. My expectation is that today's lecture will add to the existing body of knowledge on strategies that we can adopt to mitigate and navigate the impact of the global supply chain disruptions on consumers and Jamaican economy. I look forward to the lecture discussion and to hearing from our distinguished head of the JMEA this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Permanent Secretary. Um, before I invite Mr. Kale to introduce our lecturer, <coughs> we'll have a question and answer session which will follow Mr. Mafood's presentation and everybody will have an opportunity to pose their questions to Mr. Mafood and anybody else at the head table and to stimulate more discussion. Until then, I invite Mr. Robert Kale to introduce our presenter. Mr. Kale is an attorney at law and he has been a commissioner of the Fair Trading Commission for about seven years at different times in our lives, committed to competition, and is always there for us when we need more advice. Mr. Kale. Thank, thank you for that, David. Good morning, everyone. I am glad to see that everyone is out and about and everyone is feeling very perky this morning. It is my great pleasure this morning to introduce Mr. John Mafood, the president of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association. He previously served as the committee co-chair chairperson for membership and MSME program development. He's also the chief executive officer of Jamaica Tees Limited. Mr. Mr. Mafood holds a wealth of experience in local and international retail and trade mergers and expansions and turnarounds. He's also a certified public accountant and a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Jamaica. He's an inc inclusive leader from, a from the boardroom to the factory floor and credits much of the JTL group's success to his dedicated staff. He lives by the inspiration of his late father and former JTL chairman, Adib J. Mafood, a man of honesty, integrity, and hard work. This is a driving philosophy behind the Jamaica Tees Group, which has made a major impact in the marketplace since its listing on the, Jamaica, on the junior market of the Jamaica Stock Exchange in 2011. Mr. Mafood is also invested in philanthropic work and is an avid social commentator. He's a recipient of several rec uh, commendations, include being a Jamaica Observer Business Leader nominee in 2014. I myself must say that in terms of my knowledge of Mr. Mafood, I've often seen his columns and his very um, hot takes on situations in Jamaica, the crime situation in particular, um, in which I am in general agreement. And so I'm definitely looking forward to a very direct and very knowledgeable lecture this morning. So without any further ado, Mr. John Mafood. Good morning, everyone. I, I was hoping to use this um, phrase, all protocols observed. But since there's not many people to observe, I will say um, uh, Mr. David Miller, Executive Director of Fair Trading Commission, Sancia Bennett Templer, wonderful uh, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, uh, and Robert Colley, Director, Chair, Deputy Chairman of the FTC. Morning, everyone. I should also welcome Captain Jay from Kingston, Freeport, who is going to talk to us um, about all the problems of shipping. I've been working with um, <coughs> 
uh, Captain Jay and others um, trying to figure out um, how to um, resolve some of the problems at the, that we are experiencing at the port. Um, and he's, I must say, the, the way that the, the, the managing company operates is very professional. Uh, they have a lot of problems on their hands to deal with, but they are looking out for us as manufacturers and importers, and I thank them. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to just remind us a little bit about the background and how we got here. It's hard to imagine, to think about the fact it's been three years now, 20, 21, 22, that we have been dealing with COVID. And um, basically we are on the way out of the problem from a medical standpoint, but we are still feeling the problem from an economic um, and company standpoint. So COVID struck in 2019 in the US and by early 2020, we saw the dramatic action of the US government to lock down um, schools, restaurants, businesses, entertainment, all travel stopped and work from home started. There was an immediate change in the American eating habits um, to in-home cooking and home delivery. Um, our own company, which manu manufactures food products, in, in early 2020 saw a dramatic increase in our exports to the US. It, it, it increased by maybe 40% all of a sudden because now uh, people were preparing food at home, uh, drinking a lot of tea and so on, not going to restaurants. And um, we, the, the, the buying habits changed too. They, they went to online purchases. They started buying home entertainment items, new appliances, home improvements, more cleaning products, sanitizers, toilet paper, etc. This was around the same time that China had their lockdowns, which affected manufacturing and port operations. U.S. retailers and importers were not prepared for the dramatic shift in the buying habits and quickly ran out of stock. U.S. companies practice just-in-time inventory to the extreme, and a typical supermarket, no matter how big they are, only carries stock on the shelf. They don't carry back stock. And even the, the distributors to the supermarkets carry only enough for a few days of, of sales. So they practice this system of anticipating purchases to go out um, as they come in. In Jamaica, on the other hand, even the smallest supermarket, if you go in there, they have a back, a back store that has more goods in the back than on the shelf. So typically, as the sales take place in the, in the retail side, it's filled from the, the warehouse. And a, a typical store would have two or three weeks worth of supplies in the back. As the US supermarkets ran out of stock, customers panicked and bought more, and the retailers and importers started ordering more and more goods from the Far East. The Far East manufacturers and shippers could not keep pace with this extra demand and, and started to increase their prices of their goods. And that happened very quickly in 2020. And shipping costs increased from $2,000 in late 2019 to eighteen to $20,000. It was also interesting for me to note that the shipping cost to the U.S. Uh, varied from China. Um, 
It varied, for instance, it was cheaper to ship to, from China to New York than it was to ship to Florida. Um, and for us to ship to the US still remained relatively low. It still remained at $2,000 to ship from Jamaica to, um, to Florida or New York. So it was interesting that the customers we shipped to in the US, depending on where they were, having to pay from China eighteen to $20,000 or more, but the import from Jamaica was only $2,000. That big gap that existed um, created an opportunity for us in Jamaica to export, to compete with China, and to export to the US. And, and, and our sales jumped dramatically, as I said. They also, the shipping from the Jamaica to the US appeared not to have been affected. And maybe Jay will explain why that is, but while there were dramatic problems in shipping from the Far East to the US and to Jamaica, there was no problem shipping within the CARICOM region or to the US. The, there was insufficient ships and containers available um, from, to ship from the Far East to this side of the world because shipping lines, I think, some of them retired all the ships during the early part of COVID, and empty containers were stuck in various parts of the world. Then, during the latter part of 2020 and into 2021, ships started arriving in huge numbers, especially to the US, and US ports could not handle the increase. And you will remember from the news that there were these huge numbers of ships sitting outside the harbor in Long Beach, California that couldn't get into the, 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 the port to discharge. Uh, and you can imagine that um, the ports couldn't handle those extra shipments. The rails couldn't handle those extra shipments to the East Coast. Um, and those ships that were stuck out there couldn't travel back to China uh, and the Far East fast enough and couldn't travel to other parts of the world. And this then created this inconsistency in being able to plan your shipments. Typically, from China to this region is 30 days. Um, we started to see in, see in um, containers missed shipments, shipments not coming. It started to take 120 days from 30 days, all our calculations were thrown off. And all of a sudden, we started to panic as importers and order more and more, just hoping to get something. This, in turn, led to a worsening of the shipping availability around the world and very long delays in getting goods that were ordered. The result of this is that companies around the world have experienced significant price increases from the Far East that could not be fully passed on to customers. They have become seriously overstocked as goods eventually did arrive in early part of this year, 2022. Uh, we in our own company, and we see it companies that were listed on the stock market and their information is available. So two, three times increases in their inventory level. And of course, they also lost sales in the period when they didn't have those goods. Profits declined due to the higher costs, such as interest, which they had to borrow money to pay for this. Consumers and ordinary Jamaicans also suffered due to the inflation that started in the second half of 2021 and the, the decline in the economy due to the layoff of, of, of basically the tourism and entertainment industry and retailing. And small businesses went out of business in, in late 2020 
2000 and early 2021. It is worth noting that Jamaicans fared better than many small and vulnerable nations because the macroeconomic policies of the government has been good for the last nine years, both under the PNP and the GLP, with a focus on stability and debt reduction and maintaining significant foreign exchange reserves. There was a solid performance in my mind in the Ministry of Health in managing COVID. And the government manages, managed the economy well and allowed manufacturers to remain open and BPO operators to return to work quickly. Private sector also used the opportunity in 2020 and 2021 to re-engineer and become more efficient. And this has allowed them to weather the storm in 2022. And I saw that again, when you look at the accounts of companies in 2021, they returned to profitability, profits increased, even though business was down. And that in 2022 means that this long protracted economic downturn, they have been generally able to, make, to weather that storm. Having said that, the US economy had a rebound in 2021, primarily in the housing and in stock market. People in the US started to move out of cities and purchase houses in more rural areas, including places um, like Florida. People realized that they could work from home wherever that was. There was a boom in the home building and improvements. And this again created shortages and resultant inflation in building supplies, lumber and steel and plywood. We felt this in Jamaica, and this has led to a significant increase in the price of houses. Finally, we had, we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine in February this year, which has led to the grain um, price increases in grain, shortages in grain and vegetable cooking oil. This, of course, and, and also uh, um, oil prices at $100 a barrel. Some things have improved in 2022 with the opening of the economy. Stronger tourism with 90 to 100% occupancy targeted or expected for this winter season and the reopening of all businesses. Also, we have seen a significant reduction in freight costs in the last two months, as the world economies have slowed. Container costs are now at five to $6,000 coming from the Far East, from a high of 20,000 or possibly more. And I expect this to return to pre-pandemic levels early next year. Maybe Jay can throw some light on that. Most importantly, we are seeing a moderating trend in inflation worldwide as economies slow down. This decline in trend in inflation worldwide will filter down to Jamaica as the cost of imported items decline. Ever since the BOJ started increasing their policy rate in October 21, if you remember back in September and before, the BOJ policy rate was half of a percent. It, it is now 7%. And I have been advising against these increases because they have zero effect on imported inflation. I can only hope that the BOJ comes to their senses before they damage prospects for growth in 2023. However, we still have problems. We still are having serious supply chain problems. Shortages of packaging material, glass bottles and cans, pet bottles, sugar, 
Um, we have a, someone from Red Stripe who, who can attest to some of those problems, uh, and some of us who drink Red Stripe. Um, ports in our regions are backed up with both empty containers and full containers. Local importers either don't have a warehouse space to bring in their goods, bring in their containers, or don't have the funds to pay the duties and, and, and cost of, of land in their goods. This means that we as a business people must pay serious attention to our ordering and inventory management and must carefully manage possible out of stock versus overstock. Both can kill a company. There are some large US retailers that are facing closure because of the fact that they are now overstocked and short of funds. We as a company um, realized we had to do certain things differently because we also faced the situation of our inventory levels um, tripling compared to last year. And we felt the effect of running out of cash and having to borrow. So from a procurement standpoint, you have to make procurement the responsibility of the very senior peep management in your organization. You know, in most larger companies uh, and so on, the procurement is an important area, but once it's going well, it's, it's, it's like an automatic. That has to change. Consider changing suppliers even if you have a long relationship with your current supplier. And some of us tend to delay that too long and also get into trouble. Consistently follow up with your suppliers after placing your order to ensure that your shipment gets priority. We, we saw that, we learned from that experience too. You place your order, the, orders, uh, the, the supplier says your order received, you don't get your goods, you call, and they said, well, we couldn't ship it out for two or three months. So that means you're having to constantly be following, tracking your, your orders. Contract with suppliers for annual volumes where you can. Instead of just placing order, one order after the other, a supplier will give you more attention if they see the full picture of your annual requirements. And develop personal relationships with your suppliers, including Zoom and personal visits where possible. This will increase the likelihood of your shipment being prioritized. Don't just depend on emails. So, you know, when you know a person's name, you, know, you see them, you become colleagues, even though they may be in China, you're going to get the attention. Speak with your local shipping agent to work out, to work on your behalf in helping to make shipping arrangements in the Far East. And learn as much as possible about the industry of your supplier and understand their supply cycle. I must tell you that some companies in Jamaica have used the opportunity of the chaos and high shipping costs to change their business model one of our members, Fostridge, who is an importer of electrical suppliers and electrical conduits, now makes them locally and they sell to the local market and export to CARICOM and they're able to do so because the, the importers in Trinidad and Barbados have to pay $20,000 for a container of conduits and it may take 120 days or more. <clears throat> that differential in cost of freight, the nearness, the fact that it's only three days transit time instead of 120 days, allows Fosridge and many other companies to take advantage of the bad news IGL used to import oxygen and CO2 
and now make it here for domestic and for export purposes. A, a lot, we will remember during the height of COVID when the hospitals ran out of oxygen and people died. <coughs> that was when IGL used to import oxygen. Now they make it and they make enough that they can satisfy all the demand for Jamaica and to export it. CO2 is the same thing. They used to import all the CO2 because of logistical problems. Um, we weren't getting the CO2. Red Stripe can tell you that their customers became very, very upset because CO2 is an integral part in, in, in dispensing red stripe beer, making sodas and other things. IGL made the investment in putting in a CO2 plant <coughs> uh, recently, and that plant will be able to satisfy the demands in Jamaica and for export. We saw furniture and bed manufacturers exporting for the first time and, and Bed, uh, mattresses exporting for the first time to Trinidad um, again because of that um, difference in freight a container of mattresses is a, the freight cost is a big element of the cost of a, of a container of mattresses or furniture this made us competitive we saw toilet paper manufacturers exporting to the US and to CARICOM, and again, you'll remember there was a time when the US ran out of toilet paper and people became desperate. And there's a big potential for other similar things to happen. Our own company started to work with other Jamaican manufacturers and put their products in our containers and ship to other Caribbean countries. We started to bring in products, finished products from the Far East in 40-foot containers, put it in bond, and redistributed redistribute it to other Caribbean countries. So we have great potential to export to CARICOM. We are all small and vulnerable nations, and we need to be focused on supporting each other instead of buying from outside of the region. We are near to each other. Freight rates are very good. As I said, $2,000 to Trinidad or maybe less. And two days shipping. Shipping is good. Our habits, buying habits and history is, is the same as in Jamaica. Um, the permanent secretary made reference to the 2525, which is um, intended to band together the Caribbean countries and make them more um, increase trading among ourselves in the region to make us more less vulnerable to these extra regional shocks. I really think that um, it's important. And it is my focus as president to push for exports to CARICOM where we have a bigger market than our domestic market. Three million people in CARICOM, three million people in Jamaica, but three times our per capita income. This all, this in the same way that there is an opportunity for Jamaican companies to export to CARICOM, to export to the US because of the differential rate of shipping rate and the differential in shipping time creates the opportunity for foreign companies to near shore in Jamaica. The permanent secretary made reference to that as well. And I think that was part of the discussion at the recent conference. And you can see the, the advantage. Um, shipping costs from Jamaica to Miami is less than 2,000. To New York, it's 2005, and the transit time is a couple of days, versus that uncertainty of shipping from China. 
or the Far East. The, we do have a problem though. It's not an easy sell um, to say to foreign manufacturers uh, come to Jamaica, you know, because our population and our market is relatively small, so they don't. They won't have a domestic market that strong. They will, look, they will have to justify nearshoring on the basis of what they can do in terms of uh, selling to the region and selling to the U.S. Uh, many years ago, we, we did have um, something similar to that when we had this 807 garment manufacturing arrangement where companies manufactured here and, and shipped to the U.S. duty-free. That, that's something that can still work uh, in Jamaica, but, and I'm really encouraging it. It's just realizing that it's tough. Our electricity cost is high, small market, as I said, but it should be pursued. Finally, we saw our balance of trade deteriorate by U.S. $1 billion in the first six months of 2022. If this rate were to continue for the, for the year, we would have a trade deficit of $6 billion. That is the highest trade deficit we have ever experienced. This deterioration was caused by the increase in the price of oil, um, the low exports of aluminum, alumina due to the fire in the, in the plant last year, and importantly, the import of raw materials and goods that are destined for the tourist industry. So we have seen our tourist industry growing this year, now at 70% occupancy and aiming for 100%. The goods have to come in, the goods have to be made in Jamaica for the expected 2.5 million tourists. So it, it shows up in our import bill, but the offset, which is the impact on exports, is not there because we don't treat sales to our tourism industry as export. That comes in terms of services. So while the deficit is more than offset by the earnings from BPO, yeah, the, the deficit of six billion is more than offset by the earnings from BPO, tourism, and remittances. But I would still like to see us play a bigger role in exporting to our neighbors and narrow the trade gap. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and I'm open later on to any questions. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Mafood, for bringing that piece of information to us, sharing your experiences and giving us some insights on what are some of the things that have been working and what some of the things that they're looking for. I invite questions from the, from the group, from the audience, and from persons online who may type in their questions in the chat and have it relayed through our moderator, Mr. Colley. So the floor is open. Any questions, any comments, any insights? Dr. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Nafood. Um, much of your presentation uh, was premised on a changing environment uh, in terms of, you know, the, relative shipping costs and different times, et cetera. Uh, we are going through a period of uncertainty that COVID and uh, the um, geopolitical things have stretched the rubber band, but we're not quite sure where it's going to go back to. Will, will, will we go back to pre-pandemic um, operations or will things change? Um, I think we're seeing some change, which might be permanent. Um, 
people have become accustomed to Zoom, so we don't have as large an audience here as we would have in the absence of Zoom. Um, but I have no doubt that much of the logistics difficulties which have been created will work their way out at some point. And shipping from China will be just as easy as it was prior. So, the, for instance, in the U.S. now they're talking about um, some kind of an industrial policy to you know, manufacture more of the things locally. Uh, but the reason why they were in Asia in the first place was a difference in cost. And the fact that you have had an upheaval doesn't mean necessarily that um, it, it then makes sense. I mean, an, an example which comes to mind is that um, when we have a hurricane, you know, lots of buildings get destroyed. But we don't make all our houses with walls as thick as churches. We have a few buildings, usually churches in country parts, that have walls that are two or three feet um, thick. And in the case of an emergency, people can shelter in there. But we still, uh, we, we can't move to a stage where all risks are removed. So the question really is, um, what happens when things settle down, uh, will the shipping connections to the rest of the Caribbean um, be intact? Um, w how will those costs then compare with costs from shipping abroad, and will it will it change the trajectory for what you what you are seeing? I think those are issues which we really don't have the answers to yet, but you clearly are thinking through. Um, some of the possibilities. Okay, thanks for, the, thanks for that question. Uh, Mr. Mafoon? So, um, as you said, we hope that next year, we hope that next year things will start to go back to normal. But we don't know, right? Because we don't know what's going to happen in Russia, Ukraine. That's still a big uncertainty. Um, and, and the possibilities are from one extreme, the destruction of the world, to the other, that it is resolved um, amicably. But I do expect that if um, things continue as is, and COVID is um, um, maintained, you know, we continue to see the, the reductions and so on, and no resurgence. Uh, eventually, in 2023, we do hope to see a, a, a resumption of normal activities. And then we have to look back and say, what did we learn uh, from the experience of three years of COVID? And I think certainly people will be a lot more careful about how they view um, uh, a normal situation. In other words, pre-COVID, companies were making decisions on the basis that everything was going to be fine. They didn't have a lot of redundancy built in. They, they um, didn't have preparations, even though we have this thing called risk management. No, nobody anticipated this, but it does make us realize these extreme events are possible. And so we have to plan our business better. And as I mentioned to you, one of the good things that happened is that companies retooled, re-engineered, and become a lot more efficient and, and are able to compete globally better in Jamaica. That speaks to the opportunity, whether shipping costs come down or not, that we can export. If we make goods for Jamaicans, we can sell those goods to the CARICOM nations. And I hope um, that people in Trinidad and Tobago, Trinidad and Barbados and others, uh, as um, Permanent Secretary made reference to the, the 25, 25, they'll see that there is an advantage in having redundancy, having a a protected economic environment in the Caribbean. Um, it will also weaken up uh, companies in the U.S., as you said, 
uh, they're either going to near shore, they see the, 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 the fact that China still has a virtual lockdown um, because of COVID. So they see the vulnerability of depending only on China, and I think that is going to change. They're going to move to other countries to make their products. They may move to the Caribbean, well, we hope so, but it's going to be hard, tough uh, fight to convince them. And they may move to manufacturing more of their goods in the U.S. But there, is, there are lessons to learn from this that we have to take forward. If you have started exporting, as Fosridge did to, to Trinidad, um, and they established good relations with the companies there, those relations will continue. Just because freight rates come down, people will still see if Fosridge is a good and dependable supplier. They'll continue buying from them. So I, I see those things happening, and um, I, I think it has woken us woken up waking us up to these big events, and we have to protect ourselves better. We have to make our factories more efficient. So I see it as in a good way. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Alford. Sir? Okay. Um, could you take the microphone in the middle, please? <laughs> Not so at all. Okay, I just uh, would like to comment on those what we have said. I mean, uh, I have heard what has been told, but in my view and the view of uh, companies which I know, it's that globalization that we know before COVID is over. No more. So the normal which we know is not normal anymore. We would have to get used to, to the new normal. Situation on the world, uh, especially with the view of the war, Ukrainian and the Russian war, Chinese, and the possible conflict US-China. It's mean, and I'm pretty sure that the globe will start to look the, for a new manufacture places or diversity. It should be spread. The thing that has been everything that's big factor we call China is over. Everything before it was practically in China. And we have seen, the world have seen how difficult and dangerous it is. Look, if the China will stop and there is a big revolution today in China, what we will do as a globe? We would have a land and a lot big trouble. So I think finally everybody understood it and making a change. The change, it's a chance for a Jamaica. As we can see, the US is trying to get away from uh, China, and it will. So it's a chance for the Caribbean, it's a chance for Jamaica. We are in the right place and the right time. We just need to be hurry. Because the time and the situation is not waiting for us. We need to be ready. So uh, having said so, uh, we also are support. We are getting ready. As you know, we invest recently a lot. We have a new equipment, but we also want to expand. And we want to be a one of the bigger terminal. Because whatever we plan in Jamaica, export. We talk about the export. Without a big port, transshipment hub, which works well, it won't be possible. So that's it, what I wanted to add. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Captain. Could I just add, add to that, too? Because all of us have been watching TV and been watching world events and, and, see and observing things and thinking about how things are going to happen in the future. But one thing struck, struck me, too, was you know, that um, Taiwan made 90% of the chips, the computer chips in the world. Um, can you imagine if, if China invaded Taiwan? What would happen in the U.S. and the rest of the world? And, and so obviously, the U.S. government has seen that too. And they are now going to take action to reduce that vulnerability by producing chips in, 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 the, in the U.S. It's things like that that are eventually going to start to make a change 
uh, around the world, as, as uh, Captain Jay said. And we have to figure out, uh, and Permanent Secretary have to figure out how Jamaica becomes part of that solution and benefits from it. Good morning. Let's go ahead. Good morning. And I share the sentiments of you, Captain. My thoughts are twofold. Are you hearing me clearly? Sorry? Yes, or go ahead. Twofold. Um, firstly, when, with the concept of nearshoring, as you had mentioned and alluded to earlier, would it be possible for Jamaica to become more attractive to foreign manufacturers by implementing or enhancing our special economic zone capabilities? And that is one and two locally. As you can understand, many of your members have complained about backlogs in getting their shipments off the terminal. And we see that it's a cyclical event, especially when it comes down to the Christmas period, difficulties in our local manufacturers getting their goods off the terminal. Can you think of a possible recommendation or policy directive that the government could enact to let us bring or somewhat mitigate these potential disruptions for local manufacturers? Thank you. Let me just quickly um, speak to um, nearshoring and, and put another new terminology on the table of friendshoring as well. Um, and that's uh, an important terminology as well because companies will want to be near shore, but they also want to be at a friendly shore where you know, there's good uh, um, relationships um, between the countries. So, so that's another new terminology um, that has emerged. Uh, Jamaica does have in place an excellent special economic zone regime which provides excellent incentives for investors um, who work in that regime. I don't have the exact figure, but I know there is well over 100 um, companies that are currently operating under the special economic zone regime because we do allow for standalone special economic zone facilities. Um, the push for Jamaica now is to move into larger scale um, special economic zone facilities. And of course, the number one facility that, that we are looking at is the Cayman Special Economic Zone because of its proximity to the Port of Kingston, its proximity to the Norman Mann International Airport, the possibility of a rail link between that Cayman Special Economic Zone directly into the Port of Kingston. Um, so the Port Authority is now working very closely in terms of that facility. The government intends to de-risk that facility by bringing to the gate of that facility all of the infrastructure that will be required to support it. So we're talking about things like light and water and so on to ensure that development can happen quickly. Um, the government will also put in place custom facilities um, because if the goods are coming into Jamaica from that special economic zone, they would have to go through um, custom procedures as well. Um, so there is a big thrust now to move ahead very quickly um, in getting, and, and we're already promoting for major developers to come in and invest. And as the major developer who would build out that special economic zone. Um, Jamaica Special Economic Zone Authority also has on the books four special economic zones on the North Coast one for pharmaceuticals, one with a sports theme, one for the creative industries, and the final one is eluding me at the moment, but um, those are being looked at on the north coast of Jamaica as well. And again, we are beginning to promote those. So the um, event which took place in Montego Bay um, over the last two days, would have been pitching those investment opportunities to private sector. And as I indicated, there were prospective investors from many countries across the globe. Earlier this year, we also hosted um, uh, the World Free Zone Conference um, in the middle of the summer uh, as well. And that event so over a thousand participants, um, again, from right across the world. So 
we are pushing. I, I think, um, Mr. Mufu, that the time is now. As you said, the, the arrangements that are put in place now, the partnerships that are put in place now, are going to make a huge different for the difference for the future. Um, the first speaker um, in, in the question and answer period spoke about this elastic band, and I thought it was a good analogy. The truth is it's not going to snap back, as Captain and, and Mr. Mahfoud said, to where it was before. The world has changed. Jamaica now needs to seize the moment and take advantage of it, because as I indicated in my presentation, we are near shore. We have a, a good regime in terms of our special economic zone regime. Um, and we have shown with the BPO sector, which grew from 12, 13,000 employees back in 2012 to 55,000 employees today. We have shown that we have the labor force that can adapt to work in these new environments. Thank you very much for that, <coughs> for that permanent secretary. Are there any other comments or questions? Let's go ahead. No. Check it there. there. Hello? I've been told to sit. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. So I work with, a, it's more of a comment, um, following up on what Mr. Mahfoud said about exporting um, into the CARICOM region and so forth. Um, I work for Zomo International, which is, a, you know, we import most of our products here and we manufacture soft packaging and you know commercial printing and what we have found during this you know they say every crisis there's an opportunity is there is actually more here in Jamaica as well too so we have found um, during this time where COVID was prevalent that companies that only imported or imported mostly are looking for local manufacturers as well for some of their solutions and that has given us opportunities. So our sales went up significantly during this period as well because we seized those opportunities. So there is scope. We are in an importing country. We have been for many years and you know the conversation is moving around, you know, doing more here, manufacturing more here. And I see that as, as great scope for us to seize those opportunities as well. And yes, the cost to produce here is going to be different than importing, but the delivery time is shorter. The quality, you're, you get to touch and feel the quality long before it gets here. So there's significant advantages to having local suppliers. And I think that's something that you know, we continue to promote and support so that this country can become richer, um, especially with local manufacturers buying, you know, buy from each other and make it more efficient because that's really important and we can do it. There, there is a scope for that. We are looking at that efficiency is important, um, automation is important, and a lot of companies with, you know, the work from home and those initiatives have seen the drive to make your operations more fluid than you know, a lot of the manual processes and paperwork that we used to do. So I think this is a, a great time for Jamaica and a great opportunity for the manufacturing sector. Thank you. Thank you very much for that insight. Encouraging local could, manufacturing. Could I just re um, add to that comment? Because in, in your industry, um, I think there is a lot of opportunity to produce hair and substitute imports because uh, there was a time when it was cheaper to buy from the Dominican Republic packaging material, boxes that you are now making for our company um, <clears throat> because for some reason 
printing companies in Jamaica, whether they're making carton boxes or, or printed boxes, were not sufficiently efficient. And um, that is an area, carton boxes and printing, that we could bring a lot of business back to Jamaica. Uh, just, and maybe because of the improved efficiency that we have seen from COVID, that will also um, rebound to the benefit of our local manufacturers. Thank you. Do we have any other comments or questions? Going once. Yes, good morning, Mr. Mahfoud and Mr. Gaskill. Um, I'm an economist by training. Um, my question to you is this. You have mentioned that the export sector in Jamaica has taken advantage, exploited in a good way, the, the situation that arose from the, the COVID pandemic. Um, and you mentioned companies up to 40% increase in the revenue. What I'm saying, what is it about those exporters that are able to take advantage of the situation, that what is present among them that was absent from those other exporters who were not so able to do. Um, do you have an idea of what separated those who were able to nimbly um, adjust to the situation as opposed to those who couldn't get out of the block? And in perspective on that? Um, I don't think that our local manufacturers are aggressive enough. Uh, that, define, that, define aggressive. They're content to manufacture for our poor three million people. Um, and um, th that's my opinion. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to go and beat the bushes, go and to all the islands around the Caribbean uh, to face your new customers, or new potential customers, um, try to find ways of encouraging them to test your products. Um, there are not enough of that happening. Some companies, and, and I think that one of the reasons I tout the junior stock exchange is that companies that are brave enough to go on the junior stock exchange and expose themselves to the public and expose how well they do or not. Have, I have seen them lift their um, performance s substantially from even our company from 2010 when we listed to, to now. I know that we have benefited greatly uh, we, we, we see, we put, our, we put our board of directors there to advise us, to set parameters and strategy, and to hold us accountable. And we lift our performance. So we know that we can do that. Uh, there's 40, going to be 46 companies on the junior stock exchange that has created $220 billion of wealth. And our, the JMEA, our goal is to add another 30 companies um, in conjunction with the Jamaica uh, Stock Exchange. Um, because we see that Jamaican companies can change. And um, that is my hope. The opportunities are there. It's not easy. Uh, but we have to lift ourselves. We only export to CARICOM like a hundred million dollars of food and, and, and drinks a year. That should be much more. That could be 500 million or 400 million a year to the three million um, wealthy people in the Caribbean. Uh, and so my role is to try to encourage them to see, for them to see the opportunities. Um, the, the Ministry of Industry have their program to try and work with other Caribbean countries to um, get people to lift themselves up 
and become much more aggressive, not so comfortable, realize the market is very small here, and they will never grow if the focus is only on Jamaica. We have to get that message out constantly. Okay, thanks for that. Um, and a follow-up question. The previous um, comment was made that automation is probably an important, great automation is probably an important um, strategy that companies can use to go forward. How do you think this will affect the level of jobs created in the future if more more, more business processes are automated? Do you think it would affect the job, process, job creation process going forward? Um, I, I don't think automation um, is going to negatively an, an impact on um, unemployment. Um, if, if you automate, if you uh, buy more equipment to increase your production, you just end up hiring more people. I, I, I don't think automation um, cuts labor force. It makes you more competitive. It allows you to grow. And um, I wouldn't be afraid of that. But the, the, the point is that we have many manufacturers in Jamaica that are um, competing in the Jamaican marketplace against imports. Whatever those products are, um, they're making it, they're able to sell it competitively in Jamaica. All they need to do is do a double shift, uh, increase their production, and go and sell to Trinidad. They, doesn't, at this point, we're underutilizing our manufacturing. Most factories in Jamaica run one shift. So right now, our problem is not automation. Our problem is the human side of the equation, to go and beat the bushes and do the work. And you see that, any co you see that again on the companies on the junior stock exchange. They weren't exporting before. Fosterage wasn't exporting. Jamaica Fiberglass wasn't exporting, a number of companies. But you, you light a fire, you keep on reminding them of opportunities, and you hope that they take advantage. Okay, um, I appreciate what you're saying, but I'm just, you, know, you spoke about aggression, but I have to assume that the prospect of making money should be sufficient incentive for persons to do what they're supposed to do. So I have to think that somehow it's a lack of awareness of knowledge or how to. So, I mean, it's the business leaders, um, I guess what I'm asking, to what extent has the business leaders gone out and trying to encourage those who aren't established in order so to do it? Um, you have the knowledge, the business, you have the contacts. They are coming from places they might not have any long history, no, no, no contacts. Maybe they have the resources to go on trade shows in the CARICOM. How would you um, encourage them to? to um, because it, I, I don't think it's a lack of aggression. They want money just as anybody. It's, it, it must be that they don't know how. And do you think the government has a bigger role to play in, in facilitating this, this learning curve for, for new? Well, for well, this in, a, in a way, the government could play a, a bigger role. You know, Right now, for many years, 20, 30 years, the government has been trying to bring foreign manufacturers here. Um, the, the issue though is, and when, when you look at the tourism industry, you see that until um, Sandal started operations, I think it was 1980, there were no real foreign hotel chains here, no foreign hotel. After Sandals got started, after they showed success um, and after foreign hotels saw that these Jamaican companies are making money, um, they then started coming in, the Mexicans and the Spanish and, and so on. So we, we have to encourage foreign investors by showing them that local companies are doing well and encourage them to come. Um, so we need a vibrant and strong manufacturing sector so there is an opportunity for the government to do certain things like uh, for, you know, for exporting the profits that you make on exports may be tax exempt 
or if for the cost of traveling, it's, it's, um, they give grants for traveling to overseas markets. Uh, at the same time, JAMPRO uh, does organize trade missions. Some of them, they, they, provide, um, they provide financial support. Next year, the JMEA is going to have a major trade show. Uh, you know, every other year they do this. So I'm hoping that companies will use that opportunity as well to showcase their products for the export markets. So, it, you don't know, as I said to you, it's human nature. If you're making enough money, if you're able to live comfortably um, by selling only in Jamaica, a lot of us, that's all we do. We're, we're not going to push ourselves normally, uh, you know, to go on the export market. Let me just, let me just add, in, in terms of government, as, as um, Mr. Mafood has indicated, Jampro does play a role in taking companies to market, and, and that is done on an ongoing basis, particularly in the agribusiness sector and also in the creative industries in terms of fashion and so on. So there are trips which are, are planned for, I think the most recent one would have been a, a major agribusiness food show in Canada, for instance, um, where Jampro will go out and support um, they do organize around large manufacturers, but around small manufacturers as well. They have a program which is called their Export Max program, in which they work with companies that are small manufacturers who are looking to go into the international markets. They provide capacity building um, in terms of working with them to understand the export process, and they take them out to market um, to expose them to manufacturers. They also have an uh, online pitch platform where they'll arrange for persons, small manufacturers and so on, to do pitches to companies overseas. Part of that is, is grown during this COVID um, period. Um, just uh, two months ago, uh, Minister Hill led a delegation to Ghana. Um, he's very convinced that with the um, oil fines and the development of oil in that country, that there's going to be significant growth. There's going to be need for various types of products and services in that country. Um, and so he led a delegation of private sector persons to Guyana. Um, and there is another such trip planned as well because the first trip was so encouraging that there is another such trip planned as well. Um, so the government does play its role. Um, the minister, um, I don't think there's a speech he gives that he does not mention export and the fact that we cannot grow as a country selling to three million relatively poor people and that for Jamaica to really move to a, a higher level of, of um, per capita GDP, it has to be on the basis that we export. And, and he jokingly says, that if he's speaking at a funeral, he's going to find a way to talk about export. So it's a major thrust. Um, we have been charged at the ministry to look at export from every angle in terms of investments for sustainable export and growth. And so our programs going forward will be focused on the kind of business climate that manufacturers, service providers as well, because we are also focused not just on export of goods, but also export of services. So our programs are being crafted around how do we make the business environment business friendly for export of both goods and services. Another question, comment? Good morning, everyone. And might I add that J the JMEA, we provide market research and export strategies. So some of the business members that you would have mentioned, they can utilize the offers that JMEA provides. So that's something as well. I hope that helps with your question. To what extent? <laughs> that's a question. <laughs> All right. So... 
the JMEA does offer the services, but we do have members who really don't take up that opportunity. If you are not a member of the JMEA, you'd have to pay for the service. But um, each person pays, but membership give you that perks where you'll pay less, right? So if you're a member, you can go into, say you want to go into the United Kingdom market, you can come in and we'll go and research that data for you, give you the information, and then you can then move on to seeing the same person will provide export strategies where you can find out better ways to do your export. So the JMA is doing its part, eh? And maybe I should ask Mr. Mahfoud to talk about the productive input relief for manufacturers as well, Mr. <laughs> Mahfoud. You, you talk about in terms of the benefits that government offers in terms of incentives for companies that are manufacturers, um, you know, they, they go out and the manufacturing facility is checked and certified. And once you're a manufacturer, there are certain fiscal incentives that, have that, that, that you can access in terms of the importation of your inputs into your production as well. Another, another question? Yes. Uh, Mr. Mafood, you at the beginning of your talk, you, um, you, you, you really did outline um, that a lot of the crisis that we face came about because of a shift in demand with lockdown in Europe and United States, mm -hmm. services basically got cut off. Right? People weren't going out to restaurants, people weren't coming to taking vacation, people had money, and people went out and spent that money, but they're now spending it on goods. So the demand for goods doubled, but the capacity to deliver goods did not, and to move goods around did not. It's not that there was a shortage of toilet paper in the US, it's not that people were using the bathroom more, People use the bathroom just as much. They were using them at home. And toilet paper for home consumption is very different for toilet paper in institutions like offices. And toilet paper, toilet paper manufacturers were a little bit hesitant to go and invest millions of dollars in equipment to produce for home if you don't know how long this thing is going to last. And that's why I said I'm not sure where the elastic band is going to go back to. I mean, w w we're not sure. Um, you know, there's a big question about how much is work from home going to be the new norm. Some people are pushing uh, for people to return to offices. Some workers are resisting. Um, you know, some people thought that uh, online school was going to be the new thing. Um, now we're knowing that, you know, there's huge learning loss with the online. So it's, we, we really don't, the world hasn't shifted yet. We don't know. Yeah, interesting, interesting. But that, that is the reality, eh? And we have to be flexible enough to adjust as we go along. If, if no other questions or comments, I will... Maybe, maybe I can just okay. respond one more time. Um, but as, as everybody said so far, you know, the, the fact of COVID itself happening has taught us a lot about the future. So, um, as Captain Jay said, U.S. <coughs> manufacturers um, are not going to look at China the same way they did before. Um, and they're going to look at ways of protecting themselves and protecting their customers, uh, <coughs> which has already started to happen in that they're now putting up big plants <coughs> for chips in the, in the US. Um, our company saw this huge jump in sales in exports in 2020. In 2021, it, it uh, did not keep pace. It actually went down slightly. So in, in effect, it's saying what you said is that as things start to go back to normal, um, you can't um, expect the same thing to happen that was happening in the height of COVID. But what we hope is that having seen that jump in sales, having changed our manufacturing to double shift, 
um, we are adamant that we have to keep the growth going. We can't just say, well, there was a blip, it was nice. We're going to fight hard to go out there and take advantage of the fact that more people know our products. We are selling on Amazon. Uh, we're, you know, we're doing things to continue the growth. And, and, and so everybody and every company is going to look at what they learned. As I said, some companies retooled, re-engineered. They're much more efficient. That will allow them to export more if they want. So that's the, 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 the takeaway. Um, when I, again, when, I, when COVID first hit, and I didn't know if our company was going to survive because I didn't know whether there was going to be a total lockdown or what. I had to look at our company, uh, what were its cash flows, how long could we survive if we had to close down. And that changed the way we also look at the future, knowing that you can't take anything for granted. So those are some of the takeaways that I, I see. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Sounds to me like there's lots of potential, plenty of opportunities for us here in Jamaica. Not only manufacturers, but also to shift our thinking of manufacturers to exporting. And to exporting not only to the CARICOM region, we need to go to the wider world that's out there. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for attending and participating today in this 20th lecture in the series. In the past lectures, we have discussed areas like banking and finance, energy and electricity, telecoms, as well as institutional issues such as the legal framework and mergers of, and acquisitions, which the Fair Trading Commission governs. But today we heard about adjusting ourselves to grow as a country and as a region. And given the importance of the tradable sector to the economy and the critical role of competition in economic development, this discourse is timely. Exploring the challenges and opportunities for recovery and growth must be at the forefront of our minds. The business sector and policymakers must continue to work together to navigate the impact for the benefit of our economy. We must work together to support our manufacturing sector to obtain raw materials at the lowest possible cost. We must work together to improve and get lower prices for facilities such as warehousing, shipping services, and port services. And we must work together to encourage investing and exporting. Thank you to our presenter, Mr. Mafood for sharing your knowledge and experience with us, some of the change in behavior that affected your company or that is affecting your company and other manufacturers here in Jamaica, and for sharing several of the initiatives that have worked for you. Having touched on several operational issues, we hope you are amenable to further discussion on these issues as we seek to continue to identify more solutions. And notably, this is the third occasion that we have had the president of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association as our guest speaker for the Shirley Playfair Lecture. And we thank that organization for continuing to support the work of the FTC and for helping us to build a competition culture among its members throughout Jamaica. Thank you to the leadership of our portfolio ministry through Minister Hill, Minister Dodd, our permanent secretary, Mrs. Bennett Templer, who today shared with us the focus of the ministry and several positive developments that are being experienced and initiatives that are in train from the ministry and from several of its agencies. Thank you to our audience today, our colleagues from our CARICOM member states who are online and you all contribute to the work that we do. And a special thank you to our technical team, the staff of the Fair Trading Commission. The quality of our staff is very high and diverse in the tasks that we undertake, from core competition work to competition advocacy, public education, and staging events such as this lecture. Thank you to our commissioners for your efforts and for your commitment to the FTC 
as we continue our work in assessing markets and influencing behavioral change for the betterment of businesses and consumers. And before I go, I'd like to make a special presentation to Mr. Mofood on behalf of the FTC, a token of our appreciation for sharing with us your thoughts and ideas for being here today, Mr. Mofood. And um, it was very insightful and, and informative and learning much of the work that the JMEA is doing is, is, is music to our ears as we seek to continue to build our country. Mr. Mofood, thank you very much. Mrs. Lauren Sims, our senior legal counsel, presents a small token of appreciation to Mr. Mofood. Ladies and gentlemen, we look forward for you to join us next year for the 21st lecture. More than likely, it will be face-to-face -face with a touch of um, online and persons able to tune in who are not able to make it. But we think the face-to-face -face mode has served us well in different ways and will continue to serve us well. As, um, as our PS has said, much work has been done, much work is being done, and there's a lot more to do, and there's a lot of potential for all of us to continue to grow as a country. Thank you very much. Um, we have some refreshments that you can share with us before you leave. Thank you.